So I'm uh, quite happy to um, have the possibility to come here today to, to look at the Institute, uh, meet a few people, um, because I think that the institutes uh, where I work, mainly the DZME, but also the University Clinic Magdeburg, um, they have lots in common, I think, also with your institute. So I'm very happy to, to be here to a little bit share ideas um, and share research results. And the title of my talk is Using High Precision MRI to Describe Human in vivo cortical microstructure and health and disease. And I'm trying to give you actually a more like an overview over different research topics covered. Um, and then we can perhaps also speak about um, in more detail about single aspects um, you're more interested in. So within the clinical neurosciences, actually the aim is to study fundamental mechanisms that underlie diseases and disorders of the brain. And of course, clinical neuroscience seeks to develop new ways of conceptualizing, diagnosing and treating them. And um, two major uh, issues of research that we are facing at the moment is on the one hand, neurodegeneration, on the other hand, mental disorders, because for the case of neurodegeneration, of course, the number of people who are 65 years or older is steadily increasing, um, making yeah, many of the neurodegenerative disorders much more prevalent also in upcoming years. Whereas in the case of mental disorders, we know that um, around 20 to 30 percent of uh, people within Europe are suffering from a mental disorder at least once in their lifetimes. And we actually now at the moment, yeah, trying to a little bit use imaging, uh, use uh, those techniques available to classify them to perhaps uh, develop personalized treatments. So it's two uh, kind of large research fields where I would like today a little bit show you um, what we have done in this, in this respect. So one problem that uh, clinical neuroscience is perhaps facing is that on the one hand, there's disease mechanisms that are described at the micro scale, mostly in animal uh, models. And on the other hand, uh, you have human imaging and behavior where the scales are quite different. Uh, disease mechanisms are often described in the order of one to 100 millimeter with respect to synaptic and uh, neural morphology. Whereas in human imaging and behavior, we're more uh, looking at um, activations in the order of one millimeter to, to around 10 centimeters. So usually there's sort of a mismatch between those two scales, between those two ways of actually investigating um, phenomena. And as many of you uh, perhaps know, because there's uh, 11 uh, uh, and seven Tesla scanners here, of course, we hope that those ultra high field um, imaging technologies can help us bridge the gaps because they do provide those image resolutions in the so-called mesoscale in the range between 100 and 1000 micrometers. So we actually hope a little bit to, to trying to use uh, those resolutions to come closer to disease mechanisms. And um, me and others have argued that uh, those resolutions, so here is actually one example that we have acquired in Magdeburg, where we were uh, proud of actually those resolutions we, we achieved. Um, so here, a prospective motion correction was used to overlie many of the structural images so that at the end, we could get a deeper resolution of a T1 weighted image of uh, 250 micrometer isotropic, which is also quite high quality. So um, this was acquired actually in two successive scanning sessions. Um, so um, of course, usually you're more working with resolutions perhaps of 0.5 millimeter, but this is uh, kind of what is possible at the moment. So you can really get those high resolution images of the living human brain. And uh, what me and others have argued is that you can actually use those information to um, develop three-dimensional models of in particular cortical function where you model the layers, where you model the columns, and therefore get much closer to the underlying uh, microstructure of the circuits. Um, of course, you can look at many different systems. I think some of you are also focusing a lot on, on hippocampus, medial temporal lobe uh, in that respect, but um, my focus system is the uh, sensory motor cortex, which I'm focusing on today. Um, it's shown here in the red and green uh, stripes um, on the slides. Uh, so uh, primary somatosensory cortex um, S1 and primary motor cortex M1 and associated subcortical structures. Um, the system is very relevant for aging and neurodegeneration when you think about the deteriorated sensory and motor abilities in older age, but also about uh, quite severe uh, motor disorders such as uh, ILS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, and it's relevant for mental health when you think about uh, chronic pain, somatic symptoms, also on those network circuits, um, the sensory motor system is quite involved. Also, uh, more from the physical point of view, actually the sensory motor system has been an early system where seven Tesla signals were very stable in the brain. So that's also why many early studies actually focus on that system. So I would like um, today actually to um, focus on three target mechanisms that I investigated in recent years using seven Tesla MRI within the sensory motor system. Uh, so a bit simplified overview here, and I would like to show you how the ongoing research actually linking those um, mechanisms to underlying brain disorders. 
So on the one hand, I would like to show you something about how you can use uh, 7T fMRI to describe mesoscale maps, how to describe offline representations in the system, and how to actually describe cortical microstructure and their relationship to, um, to health and disease. So let's start with the uh, mesoscale maps. So when you uh, want to describe topographic maps, you know, the, the orderly representations of sensory and motor um, uh, systems within the sensory and motor cortex, then uh, you're facing uh, a couple of problems because most of the toolboxes that, that we uh, at the moment use for statistical analysis are not actually tailored for 7T or 9T MRI systems. Um, so basically, when you now actually have the chance to uh, describe uh, topographic maps within a single subject individual, you're actually facing novel statistical problems. So here you see just an example where the same person was scanned multiple times using different sequences, as you see on the uh, different uh, rows and different thresholds uh, set to the data. And those different colors just represent the hand as a model system of the topographic map. Um, and you basically see, um, I hope that you perhaps see the cursor, yeah. Um, and you see basically here um, that, uh, yeah, with one millimeter isotropic, uh, you, you actually have quite, quite nice uh, topographic maps represented here, representing, you know, D2, D3, D4, D5, the four fingers of the hand. Um, however, when you go to submillimeter resolution, such as 0.8 millimeter, for example, and you, uh, you, you look at significant statistical thresholds, you see here green is missing. And green is actually the index finger, so perhaps the most important finger of the hand. And that's just a very common problem that um, you're lacking the statistical power uh, when you do those single subject analysis. Um, and sometimes uh, this is due to the fact that you in principle need to apply Gaussian smoothing to the data for most of the models to apply them. But we don't wanna uh, actually go to open eight millimeter data and then smooth it to actually apply this statistics. So we have a, a kind of a problem here for, for looking at those um, activations in one way that um, we approach that problem is actually to filter the data before doing statistics. So instead of smoothing them to actually use bilateral filters. Um, and what we did here is um, together with uh, tubing, we developed um, a LISA. This is a new software tool. It um, provides a nonlinear filter together with a later FDR correction. And as you see here, those bilateral filters, um, this is just a simulation. They basically provide more detailed, uh, this is just a, a simulation of two voxels, more detailed representations of the voxels compared to, for example, um, when you apply smoothing to the data. And what we showed uh, in this paper is that we compared um, those, those LISA statistics with, uh, with SPM, with FSL, with AFNI, so with the current packages. Um, and we saw that, uh, the, um, that LISA had the lowest false positive rate and the highest sensitivity, particularly for single subject uh, ultra high resolution data. So that LISA could actually preserve the fine grained activations, uh, whereas in many of the uh, other toolboxes, either you had actually inflated representations or sometimes signal was lost. So this was one way and actually you can download it here. It's also published, but also the, the code is available. So it's one way actually to try to target those statistical problems that you face when you look at single subject statistics. Uh, we then actually applied those maps to trying to understand how topographic maps in primary somatostory cortex change with aging. We um, tested a very basic model that perhaps some of you are familiar with. So the idea is that um, uh, topographic maps de-differentiate when people get older. You may have come about across this de-differentiation hypothesis. So the idea is basically it's just a schematic representation here that if this is a topographic map of the hand, for example, the topographic map of older adults is getting more activated, is getting larger, the representations are more overlapping. And this is why the map is less functional, is actually more uh, diffuse, is actually less functional. So this is a very common uh, way to think about uh, aging topographic maps. However, it has never been in analyzed really with those mesoscale high resolution images. So you really wanted to see, um, is it this what we can find um, now looking um, at those maps uh, with a uh, high field imaging. So we did a quite um, extensive study where we scanned um, younger adults and, and older adults uh, in the 70 MRI um, uh, using different stimulation protocols of, at the hand. So the hand was here used as the model system to see how do the maps change and how do they relate to behavior. Uh, we used a Pietzius stimulator to um, stimulate the fingers uh, and those stimulation protocols show you the order of finger stimulation that allowed us to do different statistics with them. Fourier mapping, block design mapping, but also just a pure stimulus to the full hand. 
And uh, we used a lot of uh, we measured a lot of behavioral um, parameters, sensory digit confusion, tuber discrimination threshold, different motor tests. So really trying to see how do those changes in the map statistics relate to to um, to older adults' uh, deteriorated behavior. Um, the first really surprising result was that with our um, paradigm, with our design, also with controlling for individual thresholds of the stimulation strength um, for age related differences as well, uh, we actually didn't see any enlargement of the map. We also didn't see any uh, basically increased activation of the map. So this idea of differentiated uh, topographic maps that are strong in activation um, and larger uh, was not found at least when we looked at our data. You see here the group analysis, but those plots are um, the uh, group values of the individual data where the data were extracted from each individual and then averaged in the statistics. There was the first surprise. Um, we then did population receptive field mapping with those data. So we modeled the population receptive field size of those representations. Here, indeed, uh, there was the expected larger um, population receptive field size in, in older adults. Um, However, what was also again surprising that those larger population receptive field sizes of the older adults topographic maps didn't relate to any of our behavioral pattern. Um, what we then looked at um, was because there's also prior evidence uh, assuming that uh, somehow the cortical distances between the finger representations may change and this may somehow relate to age related changes. Uh, what we saw here was um, a specific reduction between the cortical distance between the index and the middle finger representations. In, uh, so those distances were shorter in older adults, um, um, primary uh, topographic representations compared to uh, younger adults. And here it was interesting that uh, this specific effect between the, the two fingers was related to our behavioral pattern. So indeed we saw that specifically in a tactile mislocalization task, uh, particularly uh, D2 and D3 were mixed up more and at the sensory level. So there was more mixing up, um, so more referring to touch to D3 when D2 was touched in older adults compared to younger adults. It was only um, uh, seen at this specific finger pair. So it was a pattern that seemed to relate to older adults behavior. What was, however, again, interesting and surprising to us that uh, this specific pattern of reduced cortical distance between those two fingers and also more sensory mixing up between those two fingers related to better motor performance of the hand. So it was nothing that is um, maladaptive, but actually in our older adults that related to better uh, motor performance of the hand. And this was also interestingly seen in a uh, other approach we took where we really asked uh, using uh, real life tracking of the hand um, that older and younger adults uh, did different uh, finger movements with the, with the hand for this specific test. They were just asked to touch the fingers like this, uh, sorry, where's the camera, um, like this one after the next. And we looked at actually co-movements of the neighboring fingers to see does, does actually this mixing up pattern also reflect in really everyday motor pattern. And also here, it was a specifically uh, this D2, D3 finger pair where older adults actually showed more co-movement of the middle finger when the index finger touch was moved, whereas no such pattern was found for the other movements. So um, we actually uh, found therefore that this uh, reduced distance between uh, middle and, in and index finger representation had, a, uh, had some behavioral um, correlates and seemed to somehow explain some of the behavioral pattern we found. So taking this together with this, uh, this first study on, on older adults functional representations, so um, with respect to the question, is the differentiation of topographic maps a sign of maladaptive cortical aging? So in our view, it's not really a sign of maladaptive cortical aging because on the one hand, um, no changes in map size or map activation strength were seen. The larger population receptive field sizes in older adults topographic maps did not relate to worse sensory or motor behavior, at least not in the way measured in our approach. And we found that the reduced cortical distance between uh, those representations that we found was actually uh, related to even better hand dexterity. So more actually speaking for an um, adaptive mechanism being at play here. So this was the very first uh, um, idea of, of how the changes in the architecture of mesoscale maps. So this first uh, uh, point I, would, I want to refer to actually does allow us to understand a little bit how those uh, representations change in older adults and how it may relate to, um, to the different phenotypes. Then I would like to show you, just uh, give you a small overview over 
offline representations and uh, which research lines are planned here. So offline representations are focusing on representations within the sensory system that are not triggered by perception, but that are purely triggered by, for example, observation by a multi-sensory integration or by imagery or by memory. So the uh, question here was actually in how far um, the uh, primary somatosensory cortex, so area 3B that, that is also depicted here, in how far this area would be able actually to represent topographic maps that are not felt at a given moment in time. Um, because uh, this was really an uh, unclear point um, and until this time, there was no clear evidence that area 3B would be able to offline represent touch. So what we did here is we had a also quite extensive simulation protocol at the 7T, where for two uh, full sessions uh, um, made, uh, scanned at two different days, the participants were just asked to observe finger touch all the time and on the consecutive order. And they were asked to then ra uh, rate how those tactile um, interactions had felt to the participant observed in the video. And then for the very last third session, there was a purely tactile session where those two different fingers were touched. So in this specific paradigm, there was no influence on touch on the prior activations, but um, touch was actually mapped last. And what we could um, show here, and this is just an example subject, but we also did, uh, of course, um, group statistics. So we could actually um, show that. Um, so this is a map purely activated by the observation of touch. And this is a map activated by the physical perception of touch. So here in this specific subject, um, it's really uh, clearly vis visible that uh, those maps are very, very similar, uh, where the observation map is, of course, uh, much weaker in amplitude, because you have to imagine that the data um, of this experiment here are um, four times more than of the tactile stimulation experiment. So with four times more data, you see nevertheless a map that is weaker in amplitude, but that is uh, very similar in the uh, topographic uh, representation. So um, by showing this in, I think, in, in uh, 20 individuals or so, um, we, and also actually by ruling out peripheral effects um, and things like that, we could actually show that in principle, Area 3B does seem to be able to represent in a quite precise way uh, efferent, so tactile input, but also actually non-efferent inputs. This could be mediated, for example, by imagery or by memory of how tactile stimulation usually feels. And um, this... Um, is what I was actually referring to um, or what I'm planning to do as part of the ESC research. Um, so this is the research line that is just about to start, but I would like to give you a short overview of what is planned here, because there will also, of course, be um, many positions advertised you know, for this ESC grant to, to, to conduct this research. So I thought I'd give you an overview a little bit about what is planned here. So the idea is really that those offline representations in sensory cortex, um, how do actually those uh, relate to somatic symptoms. So we know that somatic symptoms are a major component um, of mental health problems where um, almost all uh, mental health conditions um, are associated with somatic symptoms. And one um, component that has so far been left out is the idea in how far uh, somatic symptoms are actually triggered by past memories of past bodily experiences. So the idea is really here to associate those offline representations that I've showed uh, to you before um, that are represented in the sensory motor system to the associated uh, memory systems within, uh, for example, the, uh, the hippocampus and associated networks. So how is it actually uh, working that those sensory representations are stored and can be retrieved in certain um, situations? And how does it then relate to specific um, emotional uh, responses? And how can it help us actually to understand the emergence, but also the interference with um, somatic experiences? So this is a research line that is planned over the next years. And perhaps for my next visit, I can then tell you a, little, a lot about uh, memory of, uh, of somatic experiences. Um, now going to the third uh, aspect, I think I have around yeah, 20 minutes, 15 minutes left. So the last uh, point I would like to speak about is uh, what we have done to understand and describe the cortical microstructure in the sensory motor system. So first you could perhaps ask, why do you wanna look at cortical microstructure? Indeed, cortical microstructure has been a quite neglected brain property over the years. Um, here you see, yeah, as most of you know, like a free surface surface or uh, the brain visa anatomy, there's many more models that we can use to describe uh, brain anatomy, brain function. And you see 
For example, here's information on the Salcal and gyral architecture. Here's information about the different topographic air, uh, the different um, brain areas delineations. Uh, but what is really missing is there's no information on the tissue structure. So those, those models that we use to describe brain function and brain structure don't show us anything about the, um, the microstructural architecture of the cortex. It's just not implemented in those, in those models. So it hasn't been really looked at for quite a while. And this uh, may seem actually quite astonishing, given that uh, the cortical microstructure is a major feature that determines cortex function, because indeed, this is the information that we use for brain tessellation. And this is the information how we actually classify brain areas. It's nothing more than cortical microstructure. And um, as also most of you know, in principle, there's the approach to use either cytoarchitecture or um, myeloarchitecture for parcellation, where um, the very famous Broadman map, uh, the Broadman areas are delineated based on uh, cytoarchitecture. Um, however, there's more and more uh, researchers going back actually to the myeloarchitectonic maps that have also been published a bit later, however. Um, this is an example here. So this is a cortex parcellation scheme um, by Paul Flexig based on the myeloarchitectonic pattern. And P.P. Monma realized that perhaps the myeloarchitectonic uh, parcellation schemes are better than the cytoarchitectonic parcellation schemes. For example, um, because area and T has been correctly identified in those myeloarchitectonic maps, but it's not identified, for example, in the Broadman map. So there is some aspects about the, those myeloarchitectonic features that give us a, price, a precise relationship to the um, circuit function. So what I was, of, of course, interested in, I wanted to focus on the sensory motor system because this was the, the idea to understand the system a bit better. And I was very lucky because by the time I looked at this, I was doing the, um, I worked at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And this was actually where the, uh, the original uh, cytoarchitectonic map of Paul Flexig was stored because it was published by a Leipzig publisher by the time. Um, so it was fascinating to be able to really look at the original descriptions by the time and to really see based on the postmortem descriptions what actually uh, was revealed already 100 years ago. And interesting with respect to the sensory motor system is that, as you may see here, the model is very different than the model that we have in our minds, where usually we actually parcelate uh, the um, sensory motor cortices superior to inferior into stripes, uh, area 3B, area 1, area 2, uh, area 4. Uh, but here there were actually um, divisions dividing the system into inferior and superior parts, something that we usually uh, don't do in, in our models of the brain. So we wanted to actually see whether those um, descriptions can, so how we can actually describe those systems using uh, novel methods of in vivo myelin mapping, using the high field images and the high resolution available. So we wanted to actually to do in vivo cortex parcellation and we first needed a MRI sequence that is known to be sensitive to cortical myelin. And um, here we use the sequence here that has been uh, validated by uh, Carsten Stüber by the time using in vivo ex vivo um, scans also uh, after the scanning then performing uh, mapping with of myelin vice protein of course iron stain with the same data so that there could be um, validation analysis could be done as to which percentage of the variation is for example due to variations in myelin and iron. And this specific quantitative uh, T1 contrast here uh, is able to explain 90% of white matter myelin and around two thirds of um, cortical myelin. This is what you see here in the plot. So we could know that when we use this specific sequence for mapping cortical myelin, at least two thirds of the signal variation would be due to variation in cortical myelin. That's what we took. And um, this is uh, how our first mappings looked like. So we basically um, mapped those um, uh, myelinated uh, um, sequences onto the surface. And we could actually sample the, um, the myeloarchitectonic pattern from different cortical layers. So what you see here is basically just the middle of the layers um, uh, visualized. But those um, information can also be extracted from, for example, more, um, um, more superficial layers or more deep layers, just the middle here. And um, everything that is in red uh, is actually showing high myelin content. Everything in blue is showing a low myelin content. And first, we were happy to see that this pattern reflected the pattern expected with um, highly myelinated sensory and motor cortices uh, and highly myelinated uh, also visual uh, areas and auditory uh, areas um, 
and also that we could see, for example, a significantly higher myelination in area four compared to area three B, what would be based on the literature <clears throat> also be an expected pattern. So this was actually um, somehow reflecting what we expected. And then we were um, actually really excited to see really a quite heterogeneous myeloarchitectonic architecture. So when you look at current models of the sensory motor system, you would uh, actually expect this highly homogeneous stripe of, of sensory and motor cortices, but that's not how it looks like. It looks very patchy, uh, there are specific islands, um, so it's, it's not homogeneous in this way. And when we looked at, again, uh, to the myeloarchitectonic descriptions by Flexic, uh, we saw that he really um, also described this patchy architecture in the XVivo data, and that he suggested that perhaps the different patches of the of this architecture are related to different body parts, but of course you couldn't test it by the time because you used post mortem data. So we wanted to test this hypothesis and we re in, uh, invited participants to uh, another session where we mapped different body parts, so we asked them to uh, move the hand uh, to um, to map the hand representation or to move the tongue to get a, a representation of the face in each single individual. And this is a simple contrast that you see here, a hand versus uh, a tongue. Um, hand is in red and tongue is in blue for sensory and motor cortex. So this is what we obtained for each of those individuals. And then we could uh, relate it to the cortical myeloarchitecture within the same individual, but using independent data sets. Um, because also measured at different days. And uh, what, uh, what you see here is that the topographic representation of the hand and the face area um, are within, uh, so the variation that we see within those topographic areas is relating to variations also in the within representations of the cortical myelin. So myelin is here at the top and functional activation at the bottom. And what is also seen is that uh, the um, uh, boundary between the hand and the face representations is somehow accompanied by also a reduction in the local um, cortical myelin. We saw this for M1. Um, we also saw this for primary somatosensory cortex, where the boundary was sometimes even, even clearer, so that yeah, this, this hand face boundary corresponded to this uh, uh, functional uh, myelin boundary. And I don't have the data here now, but we validated this actually using different measures. So we looked at the HTP data, we looked at data of, with 500 participants. We also looked at resting state. We saw resting state correspondence, so we can talk about it later. I just shown you here two single subjects to, to, to show how the, you know, the, the smallest unit looks like. Um, but you could validate it also with, with different measures. So that in principle, what we could do is we could actually provide an in vivo demonstration of those microstructural boundaries that have been described uh, many years ago. And you could show that those um, structural boundaries are relating actually to different, to the um, representation of different body parts. And um, what we also looked at, we looked at uh, in which cortical depth those uh, borders are most prevalent. So here we actually defined the borders um, at the functional level. Uh, peak of the hand representation, hand face border, peak of the face representation, the same in S1. And we just sampled the myelin values along those representations uh, and saw, yeah, to see where is actually uh, a most prevalent change. In primary motor cortex, we saw uh, significant reductions in particularly in superficial and deep layers. Whereas in primary somatosensory cortex, we saw this mostly in the middle layers of the cortex. And when we uh, think about the architecture, the layer-specific architecture within the circuit, I think one can interpret it uh, as, inter as thinking that perhaps in primary motor cortex, the integration uh, of the signal from, from neighboring areas is uh, reduced by this boundary as well as the output to the effectors. Whereas perhaps in primary somatosensory cortex, particularly the, um, the crossing over between uh, input fibers from the thalamus is, uh, is uh, reduced by this boundary because they reach as one at the layer four. And with respect to the primary somatosensory cortex, what is I think also very fascinating is that indeed those uh, specific myelin boundaries within layer four of the sensory cortex have been described in, uh, in rodents. They have also been described in monkeys. Um, in rodents, you may, for example, know the barrel cortex of a mouse where um, those specific myelin reductions uh, between uh, the representations of different whiskers are described, uh, where this is also described between the four paws on the snout. Um, in the rodents here, you see an example of the macaque monkey, uh, sorry, it's a squirrel monkey, um, where also here, um, 
so everything that is dark is high myelin. Everything that is bright is, is low myelin. We also see this a small bond areas between the representations of the hand and different parts of the face. So I found it very interesting that we have seemed to also have identified a homologue system perhaps in humans, where many of the research that has been done in the last 20 years on those tissue borders in rodents and monkeys may also now be transferred to, to humans, where before it was actually thought that humans don't have those bond areas. We, we always thought a sentinel motor system is more flexible. It, it's, it's actually not restricted. It's, it's actually, things can move around freely, let's say, in simple terms. Um, we also put this into a new parcellation scheme uh, that is um, at the moment under review, but that will at some point be available for, for FreeSurfer, for CSurf, and associated um, toolboxes, where now um, you see that uh, everything that is in green here represents the sensory motor system. And there is now actually a foot, hand, and, um, and face areas um, separate. Uh, separated um, uh, in, in, uh, in the topographic um, parcellations, so that now this part can now also be um, then uh, used basically for uh, analysis. And, and yeah, this is actually now clear that those areas shouldn't be actually treated the same. And uh, the last five minutes I would actually use, uh, like to use to tell you a little bit, because I mean, when you have such a finding, of course, there's 100 questions that you want to address. You want to actually know how does it relate to, for example, mixing up between sensory, uh, sensory uh, body part representations. You want to understand how does it change in aging, all those things. Uh, perhaps how does it relate to changes in the vasculature, in the blood supply, and so forth. Many aspects that we're looking at so far. But I think uh, today I would like to show you a little bit about how we um, related this finding to new generation. Because, of course, it's a very, very important question to, um, to ask how those tissue boundaries and how those specific uh, single subject specific architectures in the sensory motor system may perhaps help us to explain uh, changes also in, in, in the spread of neurodegenerative disorders, for example, within the system. So can we use this information in clinical terms? So in the first study on this, we focused on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a short ILS, which is a severe neurodegenerative disorder of the motor system. Um, the median survival rate after diagnosis is at the moment at three years. So no real treatment exists at the moment. And the interesting aspect about this disorder is that it's topographic. Um, so it somehow follows this, this scheme I just showed you, because either the disorder starts at the limb, upper limb or lower limb, or it starts at, um, at the, hand, at the uh, face area. It's called bulbar onset. And then it subsequently spreads over the body parts and to the other hemisphere. So that, in principle, the speed of the spread also determines the severity of the disorder. And at the moment, when somebody is diagnosed with ILS, the speed of the spread cannot be predicted by the doctor. So this is really difficult to, to really understand and to know how, how um, is the speed and intensity of the spread within the, uh, in particular, the uh, motor cortex in this, uh, in this respect. Um, so what we therefore did is we uh, invited uh, patients with ILS after their first, first diagnosis, and uh, we um, performed a behavioral test battery with them, where, we, um, where they performed quantitative um, tests of upper limb, lower limb, and bulbar function, uh, where we actually developed a new tool to quantify bulbar function. Participants did uh, tongue movements that we recorded, and then they were tracked and analyzed to make this easier uh, with a low, low cost uh, way to, to quantify um, bulbar function. Um, and then, um, yeah, they, they performed all those different tests. And here is a example of a single um, uh, patient after the first diagnosis of lower limb onset ILS. Um, and uh, he showed the expected pattern of showing in particular, um, compared to, uh, to uh, egg matched control, a lower performance of, of the walking test that tests up lower limb function, but it didn't show differences in upper limb or bulbar um, function compared to the controls. So I showed the selectivity in the, in the lower limb functionality. And we performed then um, 70 scanning uh, with this patient, but also, of course, with other patients, um, where we asked the patient to move the, uh, the hand, the, the foot, the tongue again to, to get those topographic representations as localizers. Um, and then we uh, mapped those data. Uh, of course, we also did the microstructural uh, myelin uh, maps. And uh, then we could actually extract the, uh, the values from the patient and the control within the different hemispheres, uh, affected, non-affected, but also within the di different topographic representations 
Um, and what we saw here, and I think that this result is very exciting, um, that um, when you look at the, um, the control, for, first of all, that and um, you see the, um, the regular pattern of the lower limb is, is most myelinated here. The scale is reversed. So everything that is low is, is high myelination. So you have to kind of think it in reverse. Um, so that the lower limb um, is, is most myelinated than the upper limb than the uh, bulbar representation. And also you see the higher myelination and deep compared to superficial layers. This is this, um, the case for the control. It's also the case for the um, intact hemisphere of the patient, but actually only in the um, affected hemisphere of the patient, there is a specific um, change in the uh, lower limb milo architecture that is now actually um, less compared to the, um, to the upper limb. So actually there's a specific uh, sensitivity of this, um, uh, of this uh, sequence to uh, only the um, representation of the, of the lower limb within the affected hemisphere. Um, it's of note that such such uh, such a description hasn't been uh, done before. So a topographically uh, a specific uh, description of ILS um, has so far not been successful. And so we were very excited about it. And what we now want to do, of course, we measured many more patients. We have now the data of 10 patients and controls, where we actually now um, in, the, in the process of analyzing all of the patients. Um, but what we really want to do with this is um, we also want to track the patients over time. So um, ILS is very fast progressing. So uh, within three years, you have a lot of change in the disorder. So we try to measure them every three uh, months after the, uh, after the treatments in the, in the clinic. And then we try to develop uh, three-dimensional models of the disease spread by really then actually modeling the different uh, changes in the microstructure, in the topographic units in association to the behavior and within the different layers to perhaps try to have a, um, I tried to develop a uh, three-dimensional model of how the disorder spreads through M1 and how it can be described actually quantitatively with those measures. Yeah, so this was actually uh, already uh, my talk. So uh, I tried to give a little bit of a roadmap of, of different uh, aspects we're looking at at the moment. So generally, uh, the, the idea is here actually to, to always link basic science. Uh, we, we do a lot of development of statistical models, of analysis models. We're also trying to... Um, to always optimize and change the, the pipeline of, of the of the myelin mapping and, and uh, make it more um, integrate more contrast multi contrast modeling it's so always uh, development in basic science uh, it's always development in, in methods that go somehow hand in hand um, and then to trying to use it for clinical application to trying to see whether those uh, developments can actually help us to to understand uh, specific disorders or age-related changes. And the final goal is actually to to try to develop personalized microstructure profiles. So you can look at it one by one um, and and see actually uh, how the structure changes, how the function changes in the same individual link it to each other, and therefore get a deeper understanding of of what happens in specific um, types. Yeah. So this is uh, the end of my talk. I hope I was within the time limit. Um, I thank you a lot for your attention, and I would like, like to also thank my group members and collaborators, in particular, of course, the Cortical Microstructure Research Group in, in Magdeburg at the clinic. Thanks a lot.